Before I start my speech today, I would just like to say that um, I'm feeling rather burdened about delivering a speech uh, of this nature. If you would ask me if I uh, would choose to deliver something such as this, I'd tell you that I'd rather be far more optimistic. Uh, however, today we've got quite a large amount of influential uh, people, in, people in this auditorium and this is uh, absolutely something that you do need to know uh, and you do need to dig further on detail. So, uh, without further ado, uh, let's go. <clears throat> so, good morning and welcome everybody. I'm conscious some of you may not have been to Gama before, or even to the Northern Territory for that matter. Can I say thank you for coming and joining this gathering this weekend. I'm sure even those who may have been here before are on a fast learning curve. The weather, the bush, the sway of the stringy bark under the canopy of Arnhem Land stars, all a cocktail of ingredients upon which we are blessed to conduct this year's 2019 event. Welcome to the bush, the very remote northeast Arnhem Land, the home of the Yungal people, your hosts. In this place where Aboriginal people live in remote Australia, we lack the basics that are taken for granted by the rest of Australia. If it's not health facilities stretched to the limits, it's the lack of housing support we are confronted with. If it's not connection to the power grid, it's the lack of infrastructure resources. If it's not the absence of a decent road, it's the lack of a safe place for our old people. <clears throat> for many Australians, these things are provided for, expected. And when they are not there, it's an inconvenience at worst. For many Indigenous Australians, these things can be a matter of life and death, and they are part of day-to-day -day life. And that is what I would like to talk about today, the way government has ignored the needs of Aboriginal people and the mismanagement of government spending on Indigenous communities in very remote locations. This year is the 10th year that I've worked for the Yothu Yindi Foundation. Can I say that it is a real privilege and an honour to serve the Chairman, Gullaroy, and the directors of this wonderful organisation. For Yongo and other Indigenous Australians to have the same level of wellbeing and life opportunities as non-Indigenous Australians. Thank you, Gullaroy. Thank you, Jawa, Yanamo, Barewa, Balopalu, Japari and Binmila. Thank you, Eddie Gumbla, and thank you, Murphy Unipingo. And thank you to our dear departed directors and members, some of whom stand in our Hall of Yongo Heroes, and all of whom we remember with tears and grief, but also with pride and love. I remember in particular Mrs Gurawiwi, who lobbied for an aged care home in this region for Yongo women like herself. And I sat in a meeting in 2014 as Ms Gurawiwi pleaded with senior public servants to build such a facility with money that was already appropriated. She died a few years later in substandard housing, ill befitting a woman of her senior ranking in the community. She's not alone. There are many other elders who carry the ancient wisdom, knowledge and beauty of our people who we lose every year for simple and avoidable reasons. And today, five years later, this facility in Nulamboy has still not been built and we are still waiting for a tender process to get underway. And this is one of the hundreds of examples that make my blood boil. Few things focus your mind like grief and anger and over the, past, over the last decade, WAWAF has analysed spending patterns and formulas through the Commonwealth Grants Commission data, Northern Territory and Federal Budget reports and audits. <clears throat> this work confirms everything we see in front of us and explains why many Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory continue to live impoverished lives. The data shows time and time again that hundreds of millions of dollars of untied GST funds sent to state and territory governments to address Aboriginal issues are diverted to other urban priorities or are spent on administration in Darwin or other urban centres. Here's an example of our frustration. 
Since 2006, the Northern Territory Government has spent over $300 million, presumably from its untied GST payments, creating a waterfront precinct which in large part has been turned over to property developers and business. In addition to the sunk costs every year, the Northern Territory Government grants up to $20 million to the Darwin Waterfront Corporation to run a conference centre and tourist facilities including a wave pool and artificial beach and events like fireworks, concerts and driverless cars. Forgetting the hundreds of millions in capital costs, that's an annual payment equivalent to 40 remote houses a year. So local Darwinians and people visiting Darwin can find entertainment. Don't get me wrong, we understand the importance of tourism to the economy, but meanwhile in the bush, the housing crisis continues, the housing deficit grows, Indigenous people are living lives characterised by poverty and neglect and despair. Another child is born to another overcrowded home, another kid gets no sleep and can't go to school, another assault takes place in a house full, of, full to bursting point, and so on and so forth. Recently, the Northern Territory Government published a report by respected economist John Langelout, which confirmed everything we have said for over a decade. Mr Langelout found the Territory is in a structural deficit, and that is the books don't balance, and this has nothing to do with short-term factors. It's a locked-in situation caused by decades of overspending and maladministration the report, the report tells us that the Territory is in an almost bankrupt situation, with forward estimates driving debt so high that by 2030 the interest bill alone will be $2 billion a year. Thinking back to our beloved Ms Gurawiwi, who died waiting for health services that have still not materialised, can you imagine trying to process the news that $2 billion a year of Territory funds would be spent not on in private not on improving the lives of some of the most marginalised people in the world, but on paying the interest bill. Quite simply, this is not acceptable and cannot continue. It is the high level of maladministration that is occurring that is the most extraordinary. Let me put some facts on the table. 99% <clears throat> of Territory Government spending is unscrutinised outside of any internal agency reviews. As a result, almost all expenditure is simply rolled over from one year to another with little external assessment of effectiveness, efficiency and alignment to government priorities. There are over 970 different allowances, that's 970 different allowances being paid to Northern Territory Public Service employees. The Territory Government does not have a single integrated management system for agencies capable of budgeting at the cost centre or providing consolidated cash flow information. Agencies have adopted a range of in-house solutions including rudimentary spreadsheet-based approaches to prepare manual monthly cash flow reports. Over the past two decades, the Territory's Government owned Oh, sorry, excuse me. Over the past two decades, the territory's, territory's government-owned corporations have collectively, persistently operated at a net cost to territory taxpayers. If the Northern Territory government was a corporation, serious thought would have been given to winding it up. If it was an Aboriginal corporation, its cabinet ministers would be prosecuted. It makes me cry that we are prisoners to this incompetence and maladministration. Yet for all of this, there seems no prospect of change. And why would they? For the moment, the Northern Territory Government is unwilling or unable to respond to the deep outrage around deeply flawed processes, decision-making and funding models. For its part, the Commonwealth seems to have happily wiped its hands of the mess it created when it left the Northern Territory to a small group of inexperienced administrators in 1978. The Commonwealth created the system that is currently in play in the Territory and has sat by and allowed it to continue unabated, dining out on the back of Aboriginal misery. And so we call out the Commonwealth Government. The Commonwealth 
is responsible for the Northern Territory under the Self-Government Act. And it is responsible for the GST formula that gives the rivers of gold to the Northern Territory Treasury. Under the principle of responsible government, the Australian Parliament is duty bound to set the mistakes of self-government right. Today, we call on the Australian, gov Australian Parliament to do so because the lived experience of the current arrangements are defined by poverty and frustration. And once again, this neglect makes my blood boil. So that's a lot to think about, and uh, so let me conclude. Many of us, and I hope many of you too, see the Uluru Statement from the heart as a light on the hill, a beacon, a flame of hope, where for too long there has been none. There's no doubt that we need a voice, a louder voice, or voices, and we will support that with all our heart. But at the same time, we cannot lose sight of the urgent need to change a system that is fundamentally broken, a system that is impoverishing Aboriginal people by clipping the ticket of Aboriginal disadvantage. And these are not easy truths, and I don't expect I will have made any new friends in Darwin, <laughs> but that comes with the CEO's job. I take my strength, I take my strength from my chairman, who has weathered decades of attacks and undermining and has never deviated his course. And under his leadership, YWF has not and will not hesitate in exposing to scrutiny an awful system that lives off the misery and disadvantage of my brothers and sisters. And I ask you to join us in this challenge and set these matters right. Thank you. <laughs>